across Missouri and the Ozarks, old mines and quarries dot the landscape. Small or large, worked by hand or machine, below ground or above, these activities have shaped both human lives and modern landscapes. For many folks today, mining history is out of sight and out of mind. But as geologists, we routinely notice evidence of this mining legacy in so many places, when we're on the ground or while we're studying maps. Some types of resource extraction are ongoing, and some evidence persists for older operations, as at Missouri Mines State Historic Site. Many places that once hosted mines have reverted to forest, and some are dotted with lakes. To the untrained eye, some of these landscapes may even look pristine, though they're anything but. This aspect of our region's history can be easy to forget, but it's relevant to remember, especially in the context of ongoing debates about the potential need for increased domestic mineral extraction to support goals such as national security or green energy. Geologic resource extraction has occurred throughout Missouri. These efforts certainly extended across state boundaries, but our primary focus in this video is Missouri, given some especially good public domain historical photo collections that we can use to explore this history visually. If you want to explore further, we'll link to our sources below. Let's begin our tour of geologic resources with granite. One of Missouri's landmark engineering achievements, the Eads Bridge, is built on a foundation that incorporates Missouri quarried granite that you can visit and admire today. Known as Missouri Red Granite, this comes from the St. Francis Mountain region of southeast Missouri, home of the Elephant Rocks. This photo captures the elephant look better than any we've ever seen. We're not sure of the exact location of this photo, but the Elephant Rock style boulder suggests that it likely isn't far from the modern state park. This quarry, labeled as being at Graniteville, is also nearby. Note the latter for scale. Today, a visit to Elephant Rock State Park lets you see huge granite boulders, as well as plenty of evidence of past quarrying activity. Elephant Rocks isn't the only exposed igneous intrusion in the St. Francis Mountains, and other quarries dotted the area, such as this one at Cyanite, and this one at Bismarck. Missouri's rich iron deposits were extracted by Native Americans and early French settlers, but iron production really increased after 1815. During the Civil War, a pivotal battle was fought at Fort Davidson, built to protect the railroad connecting St. Louis with strategic iron mines like this one atop nearby Pilot Knob. The geologic source context for iron varies between mines, some delved into deposits in igneous bedrock, such as this example on Shepherd Mountain. Although today, this abandoned cut is pretty overgrown, it's still possible to find rock bearing enough iron-rich magnetite to swing a compass needle. Not far away is the Iron Mountain Mine, another igneous-derived source and once major operation. Some iron came from sedimentary rock, where secondary mineralization produced mineable deposits. This is known as brown iron ore, and this particular photo resembles something else brown, but it's not that. The Cherry Valley Mine is an example of iron extraction from sedimentary rock. Another is the Merrimack Mine, for which we didn't turn up many historic photos, but this site can be visited today as part of Merrimack Spring Park where the old furnaces still standing have been delighting sightseers for quite some time. Iron mining started early with hand tools. It's worth reflecting on the degree of manual labor it took to extract iron from the ground and process it, especially in the early days. Iron mining modernized and continued in Missouri, peaking in the 1960s to 80s, 
and lasting until the 2001 closure of the Pea Ridge Mine. If you want to make glass, then who doesn't use glass? You need silica sand, the purer the better. The white quartz sand of the St. Peter sandstone is about as clean as it gets. A great place to explore the history of Missouri silica extraction lies just north of the Missouri River near St. Louis, at Klondike, where sandstone was quarried and shipped on the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad. Today, the Klondike site is a public park, which you can reach by biking the old rail line that's now the Cross State Katy Trail. We talk about this site some more in our series on trailside geology and nature along this popular route. The nearby town of Pacific, Missouri was another major extraction area for the St. Peter Sandstone, where exposed bluffs were honeycombed with tunnels. These photos show some of the dramatic extraction chambers carved into the hills by the Pacific Glass Sand Company. Sand extraction continues today near Pacific, now as a part of U.S. Silica. And you can get a close-up view of this sandstone along historic Route 66. and at the town's Blackburn Park. In this region, lead and zinc are often found together or nearby. These resources have a long and complex mining history worthy of a whole series of videos. The region's deposits of lead in particular are globally significant. Lead and zinc in this region result from secondary mineralization in sedimentary rocks. Some jaw-dropping specimens of lead and zinc-bearing minerals have come out of the ground. For example, here's a sample of galena, or lead sulfide. These specimens are on display at Missouri Mines State Historic Site, a great place to visit to travel back in time and learn about Missouri's lead mining history. Cavernous underground mines disgorged extraordinary amounts of waste material onto the surface producing mountains of tailings, also known as chat piles, that loomed over mining towns. Below, we'll link to a couple of copyrighted photos of these impressive underground operations, which could reasonably be compared with Tolkien's Mines of Moria. This 1902 photo of infrastructure at the St. Joseph Lead Company in Bonterre is just one operation within a zone of the eastern Missouri Ozarks known as the Old Lead Belt. Lead mining ramped up in the eastern Ozarks in the 1700s and grew ever more expansive over time. Today, though, the mines of the old lead belt are now all history. The Tri-State District has its core in southwest Missouri, as well as neighboring parts of Oklahoma and Kansas. Mines here could also be quite dramatic. Lead and zinc were both major products in this region. Is clearly illustrated by this postcard featuring a zinc and lead ore mill in what it proclaims to be the world's greatest zinc and lead district, 600 mines in operation producing $20 million annually, $64,000 for every working day. This photo from 1942 reflects the importance of Missouri mines to the war effort of World War II and its insatiable appetite for strategic resources. Lead and zinc mineralization extends into Arkansas Ozarks as well, most famously at the mining town of Rush, now part of the Buffalo National River. But there are lead and zinc mines scattered across other portions of the Ozarks as well, including this remote site in Arkansas. Most of these mines are long closed, with the exception of one important district. Lead mining is ongoing at the Viburnum Trend, a bit west of Missouri's old lead belt, where underground operations continue. Here's an overhead view of one such mine. Barite is another mineral that can occur in geographically similar areas as lead and zinc. Another name for barite is Tiff, and no surprise, the town of Tiff had processing facilities. This is yet another case where early manual labor at small-scale operations was widespread with hand-dug ore being hauled off by wagon. At nearby Washington State Park, chunks of coarse minerals can still be found along trails, and concentrations of hand-dug tiff pits are clearly visible in LiDAR imagery. These hand-dug pits are visible along park trails, 
but it can be frustratingly difficult to photograph clearly. Guess we should have changed our camera settings from JPEG to TIFF? Carbonate rocks like limestone and dolomite are widespread and useful. Let's start with building stone, like that used to construct Missouri's state capitol building in Jefferson City. When quarried as building stone, Missouri's limestone is commonly referred to as marble, even though it doesn't meet the geologic definition of a metamorphic rock. But from a marketing perspective, that's what it was called, despite Missouri having no extractable metamorphic rock. Important building stone quarries were located in a variety of places, including here at Carthage around 1900. Another major site was the Phoenix Quarry, seen here in 1904. After a long closure, the Phoenix Quarry has risen again and is now operating as the Phoenix Marble Company. In recent years, the Phoenix Quarry provided limestone for restoration work on the state capitol. Limestone isn't just useful as building stone, though. Here, the Carthage Marble Company's crushing plant is producing a variety of aggregate products around 1957. Note the large blocks of building stone in the background. Crushing limestone even finer contributes to other useful products, like those being produced at the Banner Lime and Cement Company near Kimswick in 1907, and the Ash Grove Lime and Quarry Company near Springfield in this undated photo. Although limestone was, and is, often quarried from open pits, subsurface extraction also occurred as in this 1942 photo from the Kansas City Crushed Stone Company. This was especially common within the Bethany Falls limestone of the Kansas City area, and left extensive underground spaces that could be used for climate-controlled storage or specialized manufacturing facilities. Missouri has important deposits of clay. Your basic clay is widely used for brickmaking, whether for constructing buildings or paving streets, and Missouri produced plenty of these products. But Missouri also has deposits of much higher value fire clay, an aluminum rich material that can withstand temperatures over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. Missouri fire bricks, such as those seen here within the AP Green plant in the town of Mexico around 1955, were vital in building blast furnaces for the American steel industry, and were even used in launching pads for the US space program. Clay was typically mined in surface pits, is in these early examples near Leesburg and near Owensville. But exceptions did exist, as in this photo of an underground mine being worked by the Diamond Paving Brick Company near Kansas City. In a theme we've seen before, operations started small and got bigger. This is a major clay pit associated with the AP Green Firebrick Company whose manufacturing plant outside Mexico sprawled across a huge campus. Panning across this image reveals so many interesting details, from the flooded former clay pit at upper right, to the complex of diverse factory structures, to the ornate main offices at lower right, to a variety of rounded kilns. This image from the Evans and Howard Firebrook Company in St. Louis provides an even clearer view of these distinctive structures. Missouri's extensive coal deposits played a major role in the state's economic development. It's such an important resource that we dedicated this channel's very first geology-specific video to it over three years ago. Like various other mineral resources, early coal mining involved hand tools and shallow pits. But coal seams were relatively thin, and removing overburden is a lot of work with limited equipment. So mining gradually moved underground, as in this charismatic little operation. And of course, these underground mines grew steadily larger and more complex, as they delved farther into hillsides and deeper underground. Railroads developed ever more extensive networks to help serve the mines spread across much of northern and western Missouri. As the 20th century progressed, coal mining shifted back to surface strip mining, using staggeringly large machinery to remove overburden and extract shallow coal seams. These beasts churned their way through wide swaths of farmland, leaving broadly furrowed landscapes that looked like the result of some supernatural plow. Note the trees at upper left for scale. 
Strip mining left behind vastly rearranged and initially barren landscapes, like this one from 1963. Starting in the 1970s, stricter environmental regulations at both the state and federal level began to constrain coal mining. Today, the scars from strip mining are still readily visible in many parts of the state. Yet, it's also worth remembering that Missouri's abundant coal helped provide affordable electricity from power plants like this 1915 facility, and supported untold numbers of jobs that helped build the state. Gravel and sand are used in a variety of ways, including construction and road building. As we saw before, limestone can be crushed into gravel, but some geologic contexts offer all-natural, pre-mixed gravel and sand. No crushing required. Some sorting may be necessary. In North Missouri, glaciers left behind significant amounts of sand and gravel, including within modern river valleys. That's the setting of this 1937 photo of a gravel quarry from near Chillicothe. Gravel has also been mined in areas south of the glacial margin. This 1907 photo shows a quarry delving into gravel in a terrace along the Merrimack River, south of Pacific. Multiple quarry sites were developed along the Merrimack River bottoms, as seen in this LiDAR view. More recent operations developed deeper and more extensive excavations, overprinting earlier work. Gravel extraction along the Merrimack has since ceased due to stricter environmental regulations. Sand and gravel can also be extracted by dredging modern rivers. Here's a dredge in action on the Mississippi River near Hannibal around 1907. And here, river sand dredged by the Stewart Peck Sand Company is being loaded into rail cars near Kansas City in this pre-1918 photo. Check out that awesome sternwheeler at lower right. We're saving one of our favorite photos as the finale, but first a few brief notes. We'd love to know which photos you found most interesting. Let us know in the comments. Be sure to check out the links below to the photo archives we used, including links to a few great photos that we didn't include here due to copyright barriers. If you find something else cool, let us know. And if you like this video, please subscribe and share. And now for one last fantastic historic photo. We have focused on the major resources in this video, but the full list includes copper, salt, oil, tungsten, silver, and more. Our last example showcases a former mining site on the banks of the St. Francis River, now part of the Silver Mines Recreation Area within the Mark Twain National Forest. We've covered the geology of this area in a previous video. But this photo, taken around 1895, really captures just how visually charismatic Missouri's mining history can be. Zoomed out, it just looks like a pretty river scene. But if we zoom in, you can see a fascinating collection of buildings from the old Einstein mine. You could easily convince someone that this photo comes from an old west mine out in Colorado or Montana. This area produced lead, silver, and tungsten between 1877 and 1946. Several ore veins were mined nearby, though the Einstein vein was the most productive. Though all the buildings are gone today, the tailings piles tumbling down the slope remain, and you can still find interesting minerals in them. The dam here stood longer than the rest of the buildings, even as fish became the most popular resource in the area. But it's since been breached and now serves as a kayak or playground. It's certainly worth a visit today. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of Missouri's mining history. There is more geologic backstory and other interesting content elsewhere on our channel. Our thanks to all those who've supported us with tips via Ko-fi or the thanks button below the video, and in all other ways.